This is our personal introduction to the study of human resources and organizational theory in the public sector, PSC 411, Central Michigan University. I'd like to welcome all students to the course and define in this session, generally the broad objectives and some of the subtopics we'll be pursuing in this semester's course. The scope of human resource management in the public sector is very diverse and involves many complex systems and programs and their analysis. Our learning objectives for this course are to define human resource management and what its core functions are. Many of these will be applicable across all sectors, for-profit sectors and private sectors, and for all divisions and types of governments as well as non-government organizations that work to serve the public. We're going to describe in this course the historical evolution of public personnel management, and we're going to explain the outcome-oriented model of human resources management. We will also cover the skills and knowledge that are required to practice modern personnel administration. We'll describe the importance of human resource management function organizational effectiveness, and explain the importance of linking human resources functions to an organizational strategy. I'm a big believer in organizational strategic plans and clearly, especially in service delivery organizations where we're not producing a product but delivering services, the management of human resources is critical and vital in making your organizational strategy come out as you desire and as defined by the mission and purpose of your organizational agency. We're also going to describe how human resource management can help an organization create a culture of high productivity and high employee morale in order to meet your goals and objectives. Now generally, as you first look at it, personnel management is concerned with a specific set of functions involving entry of employees into the organization, their maintenance on an ongoing basis, and their exit from the organization. The core functions of personnel management are recruitment and selection, compensation and benefits, performance evaluation and productivity, training and development, collective bargaining, and employee relations. All of these functions must be performed within a framework of broadly applicable organizational personnel policies and procedures. Employers typically develop their personnel policies and practices based on national, state, and local laws and regulations governing employment practices, as well as their unique and individual organizational mission and philosophy. Public Personnel Management, or PPM as I refer to it in the course, is concerned with the performance of all of the above stated functions in a public sector organization. While the core personnel management functions are the same in public and private organizations, and I emphasize this, public personnel management differs from the private sector in some important ways. PPM is influenced by the U.S. Constitution which plays an important role in shaping the rights of public employees and the rights of the citizens they serve. Another important distinction is the system of civil service and its role in ensuring fairness, equity, and appropriate conduct in personnel selection and practices and all of the above mentioned core functions of personnel. You know, public personnel is defined as public. Keep in mind that the majority of employees in all levels of government are selected through some system procedure that's been developed over time, especially since the turn of the century, to ensure best qualified employees are fairly given an opportunity to compete for jobs and selected based on their skills, knowledges, and abilities, not about their political persuasion. We mostly focus and often read about the political appointees of some of the strong mayor cities, the governor, and the president. And yet that's a small, thin layer at the appointee top that are defined by political appointment. Generally, the political appointed positions in, in total scope, there is not a pre-qualified reason for entry to this service. Now, keeping in mind in Michigan alone, of 274 municipalities called cities, only 89 have a strong or full-time mayor who is an executive function who may appoint a certain group of top appointees at their political will. The majority of employees, even in those cities, under that first layer, if you would, of employment by knowledge of the uh, office appointing individual, 
below that, there are a number of employees and they go through a civil service or selection process or some public personnel procedures to ensure as under state and federal law that they are selected based on their knowledge, skills, and abilities, open recruitment, knowledge of the job, testing, training, and for no discriminatory reasons. In those strong mayor governments that we mentioned, only some of the top appointees as well as the top presidential appointees are appointed without, if you would, portfolio or qualifications. In council manager cities, which encompass the, the majority of cities in the state of Michigan, for example, the city manager is appointed by the political process of the city council, selecting and appointing that individual. However, there is usually charter or the governing document approved by the people that sets forth the standards and requirements for the city manager's position to be filled. From there, typically, the city manager selects other professionals based on their competency, knowledge, skills, and abilities to do the job for no partisan nor political reasons. So again, in a public organization, public employees are appointed in ways not seen in the private sector. But I'll leave you with the, on this point, the most important facet, it is public personnel management. In other words, when an employee is hired, terminated, a political appointee is made, a selective service appointment is made by to a position that's rather public or known, a department head, the state or federal government, a city manager, it's often newsworthy. While in the private sector, no such news is made for hundreds of appointments, promotions, demotions, terminations in the public sector, they can all be, and many of them are, in higher profile situations, newsworthy or at least noted in the news. Public personnel management, police officers, firefighters, people that serve you are selected through an open, transparent, visible process. You as a public administrator and public human resources have to know going in that it's a very transparent process subject to public scrutiny and all appointments and all personal actions to a great extent are always visible for everybody to see. That's why it is public personnel management, although again, the core functions remain very similar to each other. Another aspect of this course involves organizational theory. And for two reasons you just heard, I just tied in in human resource management that this is part of designing your organizational strategy and how you staff the organization is critical to the outcome. So organizational theory is about structure of how our public organizations work, what their culture can be or is developed as already, and how that ties into achieving the mission or the organizational purpose and objectives. Part of this course will help design and define organizational theory and why it's significant. We're going to going to talk about the primary approaches to studying organizational theory and explain how public sector organizations are different from their public sector organization, private sector organization counterparts, and understand a little bit more the role of American government in American society at all levels. And then we certainly will examine the context of public sector organizations and how the influence of organizational theory in the public sector has changed and evolved over time, citing such past people as Luther Gulick and Woodrow Wilson, who in 1887 set forth a frame for scientific management involving primarily the outcomes-based design for rules, regulations, formatting government to be by regulation and not by whim of politics, and also helping start the steps to defining a organized fair, equitable method for hiring employees. So organizational theory and human resources management in the public sector really can't be separated. Because organizational theory is an approach to studying organizations in order to understand how organizations are designed and structured fundamentally. It also involves how decisions are made, how leadership is provided, how employees can be motivated, and how organizations' mission can be achieved, and how people behave in organizations. Public organizations exist in a different context and have a different purpose and have several characteristics that make them distinct from private sector organizations. 
Public organizations often approach their work through a strict hierarchy of accountability, exemplified by written rules and procedures that govern the budget and personnel decision-making, two important keys to managing any organization, but primary in public organizations. They are accountable to the public, these public organizations, and they're divided into functional departments, typically, that facilitate a given division of labor. So structurally, for clear, clarity, transparency, and accountability, we define departments so that it can be responsive to the greater organization, but in their specific way. They respond to some form of legislative and executive oversight. Public sector organizations differ in their scale, their size, their tasks, their technology to achieve their goals, and the functions at different levels of government, of course, are very different. A state government or federal government employee may, for example, go their entire career without direct involvement with the public. A local government employee may deal with the public face-to-face -face and personal every day. We always must remember that organizations are comprised of people who come together to pursue a common purpose that cannot be achieved on an individual basis. That's really the definition of organizations. Most people spend a great deal of their waking hours in their work organizations, and therefore they're the subject of appropriately designing and effectively managing them, that, and that has the need for a great deal of attention. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we've started to focus on these work groups as an almost culture and society into themselves. Understanding organizations is important for making them productive and providing job satisfaction to all employees. Individuals in their work life act and react to forces and their fellow workers. Similarly, managers, a public sector manager, for example, engages in many activities in performing functions in public organizations. A manager is expected to communicate effectively, motivate subordinates, and engage decision makers, both citizenry and in the legislative body, in a way that meets the organizational mission. This is week one notes and lecture, Professor Steve Duchesne, PSC 411, Human Resource and Organizational Theory, Central Michigan University.